Hi everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name's Alex Paul from InvestorStream, and I'll be your host this morning. We have Drop Suite Limited CEO, Sharif El Ansari, who will be presenting today. And following the presentation, Sharif will address any questions you may have. We'll attempt to get through as many questions as time permits. Please feel free to send in your questions via the chat platform or in the question pane in the GoToWebinar control panel, or you can simply email them to me, alex at investorstream.com.au. You can also download a copy of the presentation by navigating to the handouts pane in the control panel, uh, or also going to DropSuite's ASX platform and you can download it from there as well. A copy of the webinar will be available on DropSuite's website and social media platforms later today. But for now, I'd like to throw it over to Sharif, who's gonna get us started. Sharif, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for all your help. And thank you everyone for taking the time to attend our investor webinar today. I hope all of you and your families and friends are safe and healthy uh, in this environment. At DropSuite, we have put the safety of our employees first and we are grateful that everyone on our team is doing really well. As you saw from our June quarter results, we are also grateful to have been very minimally affected by COVID-19 as a global cloud SaaS company addressing a large market and whose offerings are relevant to the current working environment. I'm proud to say that we have executed well on our strategy uh, globally and with speed and agility. On our agenda today, uh, we're gonna, it's gonna be a pre brief presentation it's about 10, 11 minutes. We will cover um, the business update, cash, uh, growth strategy, uh, a short outlook statement, followed by Q and A that will be facilitated by Alex. Um, going to slide number five, the highlights uh, for the quarter um, uh, has, uh, are several. And uh, I'm proud to say that we have performed exceptionally well on almost every measure. Annualized recurring revenue, which is a primary measure of uh, growth for a SaaS company, grew by 70% year on year and 13% quarter on quarter on a constant currency basis. We are using constant currency since most of our billing takes place in US dollars, followed by the Euro, uh, Japanese yen, and the Canadian dollar. This gives us a much better view on how the company is actually performing independent of uh, currency fluctuations, specifically the uh, US dollars versus the Australian dollar. We have done this uh, in previous announcements to give a realistic view um, on, on how the business is, uh, is, is going. On the cash receipts, uh, we're up consider considerably, especially when looking at the normalized receipts that includes partner payments, uh, that were only a day or two late uh, after the end of the quarter. Um, this is not the first time we do this. Uh, this gives a better view and enables everyone to do a, a true apples to apple comparison when you're comparing against uh, historical or previous quarters. Another big highlight uh, for the quarter was the improvement in gross margins going up from 63% in March uh, to 69% in June 2020. So this is only a th through a three months period. The solid improvement was driven uh, by growth of paid users, hence uh, higher data center utilization. So you more users, paid users you have in data centers, usually the gross margin goes, uh, goes, uh, goes up. Uh, the other key reason for this is is we uh, were able to negotiate better pricing terms with Amazon Web Services, our primary uh, cloud provider. Uh, moving on to our key business metrics slide, uh, we believe that these are the key metrics that really capture our business performance and our business results. Um, we have already covered ARR, annualized revenue, recurring revenue, and gross margins. The uh, DropSuite team delivered excellent results on the rest of these metrics. Paid users and monthly revenue per user, um, which is called ARPU in, 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 our, in, in, in SaaS speak, continues its healthy growth. And the annual partner revenue churn is really best of class when it comes to, when it comes to SaaS companies. This is the consequent uh, of the deliberate shift in the company's 
uh, customer segment mix from micro businesses toward the more stable SMBs and mid-market customers. And this has been taking place really in, for the last, uh, you know, slightly more than two years from now. Um, we, we really love to play in the SMB and mid-market uh, segments because the, the, those type of customers tend to consume the higher end products, hence the higher average revenue per user products. They churn less by the nature of being more established and more stable. Uh, and you can also see uh, the same uh, thing when it comes to churn, right? So churn uh, is, has been really, really minim minimally impacted uh, through, because of COVID-19. And when you're looking at the, the annual churn uh, on the partner level, uh, partner revenue level, it's, it's just 3%, which is truly world class. Uh, moving on to the uh, next slide, uh, which is which is the cash uh, slide, we have done a, I think a great job increasing our uh, sales receipts and the collections. Uh, I think the finance team working with their account managers have really done a great job in collections. Uh, so despite all the COVID-19 challenges, there's been really nothing uh, you know uh, to, to to report on negatively when it comes to collections and sales receipts. Um, and we saw the, the improvement also in gross margins, and we are, be, you know, we continue to be super selective in our investments in operating expenditures. Uh, so we do expect our cash burn, uh, that is uh, called the net cash from operating activities, to uh, decline throughout 2020. When you normalize the cash burn for the June quarter, we'd be at a burn of 500,000. And that roughly uh, excludes the, uh, it, it, that excludes roughly the $100,000 that we uh, paid uh, as one-off payments to the board for catch-up wages that we explained in greater detail uh, in our 4C activities report. Um, so, so as you can see, um, you know, with increasing revenue, cash receipts, cross margins, vigilance on cost, the burn, we, we see the burn uh, and expect the burn to decline over the year, uh, even when making sure that we don't underinvest in the areas that are feeding the growth, uh, product development, sales, uh, or marketing. This is a good segue into um, our next slide, and we've been consistent at uh, you know updating our uh, shareholders and investors on our, our key pillars of growth. The first one, is growing through uh, partnerships. And this refers to existing uh, as well as uh, onboarding new partnerships. We grew transacting partners almost in line with uh, revenue growth year on year. Worth noting that since early this year, we have been seeing um, you know, uh, healthy organic growth of sales leads coming predominantly through word of mouth. They hear about us th from their colleagues or from uh, IT forums, and then they get in touch with us, and then we tend to work with them and, and onboard them relatively quickly. Historically, we have allocated a significant portion of our budget to physical events, like trade shows and conferences, especially in the second half of each year. For 2020, given the uh, COVID-19 challenges, we are and will be investing and expanding on our online presence through social media, high quality content, and uh, several email campaigns. We have been building a solid reputation in the market and we have validated our product leadership position. Hence, we are quite excited about this online expansion. Equally important, we have a strong sales funnel and that includes some meaningful opportunities that our team is working really hard to deliver and launch uh, in 2020. Our second pillar of growth is continuous product innovation. Um, this is something we mentioned in previous presentations and previous um, uh, webinars. Um, about 65% of our team belongs to engineering and product. So this is a massive area of focus for us. And that is a main reason why we've been driving this, this very healthy uh, growth metrics. Um, so product is a major area of focus. Uh, having solid products and integration capabilities into the partner infrastructure helps us scale better across support, sales, and marketing. Um, and uh, when, when I talk about high quality products, that means they don't need so many people to support them. That means you, you get 
business through word of mouth and through, you know, I, like I mentioned earlier, through IT forums. And that's why focusing on, on product is continues to be a critical area for, for us. The product leadership validation that um, we, uh, we have received from Infotech, and we announced this earlier a couple of times, uh, and we talked about it during the AGM presentation. Um, they really put us uh, on a different uh, level altogether vis-a-vis -vis the competition. Draft Suite also ranked uh, first in terms of intention to renew and likelihood to recommend, which is a testament to the emotional connections that partners and customers have with Draft Suite. It's not just about bells and whistles of the product. Um, in, uh, in the June quarter, we, we launched uh, an upgraded version of uh, Google G Suite Backup geared for uh, SMBs and, and the mid-market. Mid the uh, previous version was more geared to consumer uh, and micro-businesses, which is a, a version that we had from some time back. We expect a positive impact from this launch uh, in the remainder of 2020. Uh, and then the areas of uh, product investment will in part revolve around added optionality and functionality for partners and for larger end clients, also, of, often refer, referred to as mid-market or mid-enterprise segment, roughly defined as organizations between uh, 1,000 to 10,000 employees. The third pillar of growth is revenue diversification and, and improving our average revenue per user. We, see, we, we did see a recent uh, reduction in the uh, concentration uh, of revenue of the top 10 partners, and this is an area that we will continue working on. The email mix, uh, revenue mix, and that's the revenue from email backup and archiving products continues to grow. And when you see average revenue per user ticking up, and churn going down, those have direct relationships with the adoption of the stickier email products. And this is part of a deliberate shift in focus and resources for the past two years. That also coincides with our customer mix segment, like I mentioned earlier, shifting from micro businesses towards the more stable SMBs and mid-market. Our areas of focus is to increase adoption of email archiving, which is an upsell from email backup product and it takes care both of the company's data protection as well as compliance needs. We also obviously uh, will continue growing the funnel, adding new partners and, and customers as we go forward. Going to the, our uh, final slide of the presentation, um, um, if, if, if you take aside any new and unforeseen developments or implications from COVID-19, we are optimistic about our growth prospects. We see favorable market uh, and regulatory growth drivers in the markets that we serve. We will continue making selective investments in people and resources to delight and support our partners and customers who are the source of our long-term success. Um, what this means is that we expect our cash burn to decline for the remainder of the year. Um, and it, it's, it's really important here to, to, to mention this. We really appreciate the fact that many of our shareholders would like to see us to get, get to cash break even as soon as possible. And we, we agree, but we also need to do it responsibly while investing in the sources of growth. Uh, and that's uh, surely for the benefit of all our stake, uh, stakeholders. With that, um, I'll, um, uh, you know, uh, we're going to open it up for Q and A and back over back to you, Alex. Thanks, Sharif. Um, so the first question that's come through, um, it, it's just about the, the market focus. So geographically, where is the most growth coming from, and do you have a particular market that is the primary focus right now? Uh, thank you, uh, Alex. Uh, we haven't provided the breakdown in this presentation. We, we probably will do it uh, in the in the half year results. Uh, our the number one growth area for us uh, has been North America, uh, and that that is part of a deliberate focus area. North America is a massive market. Um, they uh, the the growth in SaaS products and and cloud products have been growing. Um, at a very healthy clip for, for, for some time now. 
and that's where we have the majority of our of our sales and marketing teams right now so when it comes to you know uh, uh, growth areas number one is north america uh, and then number two is uh, is europe alex back to you Thank Thanks, Sharif. Uh, can you explain how working from home has aided the business? And if it's positive, would there be a reversal of ARR tracking up when workers start to return to an office environment? Yeah, here, uh, this is this is really interesting. And uh, this is something I covered uh, during the AGM presentation. We, we've seen um, both the negative and positive impact from COVID-19. The negative impact is people some uh, s simply put off investments in IT just because there is so much ambiguity out there. Um, however, on the positive side, as, as companies in droves were forced to move, uh, you know, move online and work from home remotely, we saw actually an increase in number of leads and a faster conversion from lead to opportunity to revenue because of that need. Um, so, I, I do not expect any negative uh, impact from people starting to go back to, to the office. Actually, I, I think it will be even a positive for us. So you added just over 20 transacting partners in the quarter. Can you provide any um, clarity or color on the quality or the type of partner? Yeah, I mean, uh, usually the 80-20 uh, rule applies, right? So 80% of the customers, are going to or or of the partners who are going to be smaller uh, who have a specific need that they reached out to us and um, they they want to transact immediately based on a customer need, and the twenty percent uh, usually are the medium size or larger um, uh, service providers who we're we're trying to build a strategic um, relationship with. So it's 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 always going to be a, mi a mix and it's always going to be an eighty twenty. However, I can say that in Q2 specifically, we onboarded a, a very strategic partner um, in the UK and who's already transacting and we're building a very nice funnel with them as we speak. Alex, back to you. So notwithstanding the steady progress in ARRs and ARPUs and, and low churn rates on your backup business, can you give us a, an idea of what's being done to develop overlay analytics, including psycholinguistics? on SME data, which can make your offer to SMEs indispensable as a management tool and thus driving all metrics significantly higher? Yeah, that's a, 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 that's a great question. Um, so so what, what we've done so, so far is that we've built a, a layer of analytics that doesn't go as deep as uh, the, the psycholinguistics that, uh, that uh, the, 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 the person who asked the question is about. It's something we're looking at, but as a, as a smaller company, with limited resources, um, in the for the next two to three quarters, we, we are really prioritizing um, requirements and requests that are coming from our strategic partners and customers, uh, and those revolve around Office 365, uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, you, we we just mentioned uh, G Suite backup uh, and things along these lines. Back to you, Alex. So. Just on the churn rate, Sharif, do you see any difference in churn rate between B2B and B2C customers? This is um, uh, massive. I mean, the difference between the two is massive. And when you look at uh, B2C customers in general, I'm not talking about uh, drop suite because we have, you know, we're, we've been minimizing our focus and our uh, exposure to, to consumer. The, the, the churn rates tend to be 15, 20% per year, and that's considered acceptable, by the way. <clears throat> when it comes to SMBs, churn, again, industry-wide, tends to be in the, in the 5 to 7%, 5 to 8%. So massive differences, and that's universal. So um, you, you touched on, um, on g the, g the market growth in terms of geographic um, geographics um, and and the particular markets that you're having a primary focus, focus on. Are you in a position to uh, tell us what the mix is of the $6.74 million annual recurring revenue by region? Can you divide it up by North America, Europe, APAC, and the rest of the world? 
Yeah, uh, we we've done this usually once a year. Um, so I'll probably we'll probably do it by by end of August. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, the areas of um, you know biggest growth uh, are the Americas, followed by Europe, for, followed by, by Asia Pacific. Uh, we we might uh, update that chart uh, for our investors in the in the upcoming uh, you know uh, presentation, which will be towards the end of August, early September. So uh, this is uh, more of a statement, I think, but uh, one person just asked uh, asked the question that based on your burn and your AAR trend that they can see, is break even about two to three quarters away? Um, the, the beautiful thing about our business is is uh, probably any, uh, you know, mildly experienced investor can can easily simulate the numbers. Uh, I'm not in a position to give a specific quarter when we reach to break uh, to break even. However, I think our reporting um, has been so transparent. Um, it has so many numbers that enables, as I mentioned, any any investor to to really you know put a very basic spreadsheet, even even you know do it on the back of a napkin and and do some their own simulation and and determine when we would be break even. But we're not going to give a specific um, quarter, except to say that we expect the burn to continue declining throughout the year. So uh, this is a bit more of a, a long-term one for you, Sharif, but can you tell us more about the long-term plan three to five years from now? Um, understand that, especially given the, the present situation uh, globally, that um, a statement such as such as that can, can never be totally accurate. But what can you sort of give us a, an outline of which direction the company is ultimately heading into? Yeah, um, the the way I look at this is um, is is how to ensure that drop suite is positioned to take advantage of all the emerging trends that we're seeing in the industry. So, for example, uh, the amount of unstructured data that is being generated is is absolutely mind numbing and and for us being in a in a in a in the backup space uh taking care of a key component uh of any of any company's uh, data protection needs especially with the you know insane growth of cybersecurity threats uh is, we are absolutely in the right place so expanding upon our uh, backup solutions to capture more of that unstructured data that's being generated, providing seamless uh, solutions with great user experience and with abilities to partner with of partners to integrate with us and to sell these services, is the area that will continue to be our focus. Uh, so this is a high uh, high level answer, and I think uh, I think the, the person asking the question was also looking for a, a high high level answer. So I'm going to stop uh, stop here for this uh, uh, question. Back to you, Alex. Thanks, Sharif. You just mentioned the backup products there uh, very briefly. Can you just give us a, an outline of what the roadmap is for the DropSuite website backup product? Yeah, so the website, the DropSuite uh, uh, website backup product, uh, you know, has been around. Actually, it's it's the company's first product. Uh, I would say it's a it's a mini cash cow. Uh, we we have um, you know 23, 25 percent of our revenue is coming from the website backup. It's not going to be an area of focus for us, and um, there are many reasons why. But I, but from a high level, that whole industry has been very much disrupted by do-it-yourself websites like Wix uh, and Shopify and all these companies. And plus, you have something called managed WordPress that has embedded backup in it. Um, so we have taken a strategic decision about two years ago to to shift our, the majority of our focus in terms of resources and investments towards email backup, email applications backup like Office 365, and, and hopefully more things to come in the future that I, I will not be able to comment on at this moment. So just regarding the email archiving product, what's the potential uplift in monthly ARPU from this product? And in addition, what percentage, what percentage of your email backup customers currently have email archiving as well? 
Yeah, we, we haven't, uh, th that's a great question. And, and this is something that uh, uh, we are uh, working on as we speak. We do not, or we ha and have not broken up uh, the, 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 the numbers uh, publicly yet. But I can tell you that uh, starting from Q2, which is the June quarter, we've seen an uptick in the uh, archiving products because we are simply really increasing our focus on it. We are doing a lot more education to our customers. And, and you know, it's, it's a very rational kind of upsell. We are, um, uh, when, when you upsell from email backup to email archiving, we are taking care of two critical needs for the customer. One is simply data protection to be able to back up and restore your data if, if, you, if you have a problem. The other one is compliance where, you know, especially in areas in, in countries like United States where there's a high level of litigation, um, adding an extra one US dollar or, or, or 80 cents to benefit from functionality that compliance officers or lawyers can use to sift through years of email and, and documents to find what they're looking for uh, is, is almost a no-brainer. No we might in the future look into breaking it up but uh, we, 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 ha we haven't done that historically, so I cannot really talk about it on this call. Sharif, do you see regulation around personal data protection a big growth driver for DSC? I mean, you, you mentioned it briefly um, just before, uh, but you've also announced some big partnerships like Strato and One and One 2019. Can you just elaborate on, um, on what you see as the big growth driver there? Yeah, I mean, um, the, the GDPR uh, is the name of the law. Has been, a, I wouldn't say, a transformational um, uh, catalyst for us, but it has definitely been a catalyst. And we have seen more growth in EMEA than we've ever seen before. I mean, if you look at our growth in EMEA from eight, 2018 to 19 to 20, uh, in percentage, I mean, the numbers are, are astoundingly high. And in big part, it's driven by, by GDPR, where, uh, where the EU regulator is requiring um, uh, companies to be able to ensure that their data is safe, encrypted, not accessible to anyone, and uh, more importantly, or equally importantly, enabling uh, any consumer or, or end user to uh, have their, end, uh, th their personal information deleted from the records. And that's a functionality that we've built uh, many, many months ago uh, and deployed to, to the EU. I'd expect you. So, Sharif, simple question of this one. In your view, who are your key competitors? Yeah, uh, keep in mind that this is a massive total addressable market. Uh, so we have um, um, several competitors uh, that we, you know, we, we, we compete with. However, the, the vast majority of them uh, tend not to be specialists. They tend to be offering uh, several uh, other backup solutions for servers and for desktops and, and et cetera, while we really focus on email and SaaS type of, um, of backup. Uh, so what we tend to see is uh, we see, uh, and, and this is validated by the, the quadrant that you can see on the, on the, on the screen, you can see, um, a much better user experience, um, much better investment, much better quality of the product when you have one product. And honestly, we don't spend too much time worried about the competition. Uh, we have massive existing partner base. We, have, we still have a very strong funnel. We know we have a really good product and we're just moving forward. Um, I, 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 I don't really lose sleep on, on competition uh, at this juncture. Thanks, Sharif. So, what are the drivers of the increase in monthly revenue per unit to a dollar sixty-four? Um, uh, like I mentioned uh, earlier, the the higher the mix of SMB clients and mid enterprise clients, uh, those who are buying the the more the more featured products and buying the email archiving product, the higher the ARPU. Um, and we do expect that uh, we will continue pushing uh, in that direction uh, in, the, in, the, in the near term and, and the long term as well. So just to uh, focus further to that, what are the drivers of the increase in gross margin to 69%? And I mean, is this margin sustainable? 
Um, uh, the, the short answer is that the margin in that range will be sustainable. Um, there are two reasons. The uh, like I mentioned earlier, number one, um, the utilization of data centers have improved. As you add more users, utilization improves. Think about it as like, let's say you're operating a, a, a hotel or a restaurant. Whether you have one customer or 100 customers, you're going to have a certain amount of fixed costs. The same thing applies when you, when you, for example, build a new data center in London because of, of, uh, of Brexit, uh, or you build a new one in uh, a new data center in Canada because Canadian customers are demanding um, uh, sovereign uh, data warehousing, right? Something to happen in Canada. So, but as we get more utilization across data centers, we, you know, we expect that we will be able to, to, to deliver better gross margins. Of course, as you grow to another level, um, another massive level uh, of users, there's, there's going to be uh, the law of diminishing returns will apply. So that's reason number one. And that's the smaller reason, because it's something that we've been working on for the last couple of quarters. But the main reason why we saw the improvements is that we saw we were able to negotiate um, um, some really nice discounts from Amazon Web Services, our primary uh, public cloud provider. And that drove uh, a good portion of that cross-margin improvements. The good news is we see it as sustainable. Thanks, Sharif. Uh, just a couple more questions to go. So um, this next one is just, can you just outline your ideal revenue concentration for your top 10 partners? Uh, yeah, ideally, I mean, clearly, um, the lower, the better, right? Um, so we want to bring it down to below 50%. Uh, for sure, uh, and we're going to do, do everything we can to do that. However, it's always good to take a historical view on these things because when you look at 70% top 10, it's like, oh my God, this is this is bad. But when you look at it from a two year ago standpoint, we were at 94% to about two years ago. Uh, now we're down to 70%, right? And um, we will continue, you know, pushing hard. To bring it down further as we go forward. So ideally, I would I would like to see it below 50%. You uh, just following on, uh, I guess a, a previous question. Uh, the GP at 69% has been flagged as an excellent improvement. What do you regard as an acceptable acceptable GP for a SaaS business? Yeah, I mean uh, th there is a whole range of gross profit or gross margin percent for SaaS companies. Uh, it depends on their business model. It depends on their products. Uh, we see things from 50% uh, all the way to 80, 80 plus percent. Uh, for us, I mean, we would aspire to, to, to stay, to go up to 70s and stay in the 70s, uh, given the nature of our product and given how scalable is our business model, where we don't have to really invest so much in marketing and sales to, to drive revenue, we would be satisfied to be in the 70s in terms of gross margin. And final question, Sharif. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much for taking the time to answer all these questions. Um, do you foresee sure. that additional capital might be required within the next 12 to 24 months from today's uh, today's perspective? Uh, there are no plans to fund the organic growth. I mean, we have, as you saw from you know our cash update and the presentation, we have we have enough cash to really fund the organic growth. So we we have no plans. Uh, to do capital raises, uh, to, to, to do I feel like for working capital raises. I mean, we have enough capital and we we'll continue to drive the growth at a very healthy clip. Thanks, Sharif. Now, that's all the time we have today. Um, thank you all for joining me. Uh, I'd also like to thank Sharif for presenting and taking the time to answer some questions. You've been, uh, uh, you've been uh, very grateful with, for, uh, for your time, Sharif. So thanks very much. Um, now, as I mentioned Actually, before, a recording. Um, Sorry, I just want to say I'm also very grateful for for all, uh, all the attendees taking time out of their schedule to join the call and listen to me listen to me speak for like 30 minutes. So thank you for that. Um, so as I mentioned, a recording of the webinar will be on DropSuite's website and social media platforms later today. 
Um, but again, Sharif, thank you very much for joining me and thanks for everyone and have a great day. Thank you.